pray and we'll let our pastor get up here for a little while this morning. Well, Lord, thank you once again for allowing us to come today and to give us that want to to be here, and uh, we're going to thank you for that. Lord, I pray for all those folks that we've called out to you on our prayer list this morning back in the Sunday school class that uh, if you would, just continue to work in their lives and help them, Lord, in whatever situation they're in and, and uh, heal them or whatever, Lord. You, you know what needs to be done, so just help them. So we're going to thank you for that. And then Today also, Lord, we'd like to pray for our pastor that you'll lift him up and give him every word that we need to hear so that when he speaks that we'll hear it and we'll go out and use it to help somebody else today and tomorrow and the next week. So thank you for that. But, Lord, today we do love you. Thank you for each person that's here, a special blessing. And we're going to ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to BBF. It's good to see you, and I can tell you that it's summertime, and you look around and you see that people are trying to get the last little grasp of July stuff in them, and by the way, it won't take you long to get enough of July stuff out there the way it is right now. It's it's not only hot, it's that air you can wear, right? It's, uh, but thank the Lord. Somebody said, well, uh, I'm telling you it's hot. Well, I need to remind you, you live in Florida. And if you don't like the weather here, hang around 15 minutes, it'll change. That's all you got to do. Just stick around. But it's good to have you back and back in the house of the Lord. Pray. we got a lot of people that are out this morning, uh, a lot of them that are out with sickness, some that are out because of other sickness. And uh, we do ask you to pray for those that are going through difficult times. Um, I know Brother Bill Lewis' sisters and uh, not in good shape at all. In fact, they're not expecting her to live. Last time I talked with Bill... And uh, I know that he and his wife and I think his son and their family are there today. And uh, do remember to lift them up to the Lord. And so many others that are going through difficult times. And it's good to have Brother Tony back. Amen. Always good to have him back. And uh, we appreciate so much Sister Connie and Sister Jan holding the fort down for us while he was while he was gone. And a real blessing. And also the Brother Bill for taking care of the Sunday school class while he was not here. But it's, uh, somebody said, well, he went to North Carolina uh, up in the mountains. Well, if you saw what he was doing, it wouldn't have been a good place to be. Um, he was uh, like 30 or 40 feet in the air. And it, by the way, when you're in the mountains, anywhere you get up on a roof, you're that much higher. That's right. So it's a ways. And anyway, uh, one thing about it, if he had fallen from there, he'd have been in heaven before he hit the ground. <laughs> because he'd have had a heart attack before he hit the ground. <laughs> You almost have one when you see that up there. But it's a joy to have him back and to have you here this morning. And I hope that God has been good to you this week, and I know he has because God's good all the time. Amen? Amen. So do remember to continue to thank him for just how good he is to us. And I hope and pray, and I was sharing with our Sunday school class this morning, how that American Christianity has become sort of an unusual phenomenon if you look at it. And uh, I... I I hope and pray we'll never forget that if it were not for the grace of God, you and I wouldn't have the gospel to come to Christ. People have prayed a a supreme, but we were just reading in Acts chapter 4 this morning how Peter and and the group were actually arrested because Peter healed a man, or God healed a man through Peter's hands. And can you imagine that? Somebody saying, well, well, we're going to arrest you. I mean, what did you do that for? Oh, we could have just left him crippled. 
It's amazing how people think. And I know one thing, if, if you really want to get in trouble, all you've got to do is offend somebody's religious beliefs. Yep. Amen? And you'll get in more trouble than you can get out of. I guess that's why I've been in trouble a good part of my life. But I want you to know this. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is still Lord no matter what the world does, no matter what the world says. He's still going to be God. And one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. It's going to happen. So you remember that as you walk your life and be encouraged. If you're visiting with us this morning, we want to say thank you. And I want to give you a visitor's card if you're visiting and get you to fill it out. And then when you exit the building, if you would, just... uh, Drop that card over in the offering plates, which will be out on the table in the vestibule. And uh, we'd love to have you uh, drop our card in there if you would. If you're visiting and you'd like to fill out a visitor's card, would you just lift your hand let us give you a visitor's card? Anyone visiting this morning that wants to fill out a card? Anyone at all? All right. Well, it's good to have you here. And uh, if you've been here before, then you know what to expect. Okay? So let's just uh, relax and enjoy the Lord and pray that God will speak to us. Um, I need to say something. I need to preface what we're going, what's going to be done this morning. But let me go ahead and remind you that Vacation Bible School will be this Wednesday night. Boy, they had a great kickoff last Wednesday night. I think they had like 49 kids back there in the back. And, uh, and a great bunch of workers and great attitude and everything was going well. I walked back through there and you could actually see people smiling. I started to stay there. It's hard to find a place where people are smiling and laughing today. So... Um, remember, that will be starting at 6.30 Wednesday night and going to 8.30. So invite the kids in the neighborhood. And I think it's ages uh, b- 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 3, to, 3 to 17. So don't forget that at eight uh, 6.30 this coming Wednesday night. And also the following two Wednesday nights after this one, the 24th and the 31st. Don't forget also that the Bible will be conducting Bible studies on Wednesday night up here just like we have been. So don't forget that. We'll have a regular vacation. I mean, Bible school will be back there beginning at 6.30. Uh, Bible study up here beginning at 7 o'clock in prayer meeting. And also, uh, don't forget that the ladies' Bible study is canceled until after vacation Bible school is over with. And don't forget to be back with us tonight. Someone said, well, now we finished the book of Ruth. Where are we going tonight? I don't have any idea yet. You say, well, it's almost night. Well, it's n- listen, I have walked up on this podium not having any idea what I was going to preach. And if he doesn't give me something, I'll stand here and stare at you. How's that? And uh, I know I've had to do that before to tell the church. And this is really tough, but I've done it because I believe it's the right thing to say, well, you know what, I don't really have a message from the Lord tonight. And uh, all I can do is share with you maybe what I think or whatever. But I'm not going to try to preach my message. It'll get you and me both in trouble. Amen. So come back tonight and see what happens. How's that? Suspense. That's what it is. Come and let's see what God does and be back with us. Also, don't forget Overcomers Outreach and Living with Addicts is still available. And if you have a heavier uh, bulletin, it will give you those information. Y'all are too quiet. I don't trust quiet people. That's why I face you. I got to, I got to, I got to face somebody up here. So I guess somebody. I, I'm glad Pastor has to learn quickly. You got to trust those in the choir, one way or the other. So we do. But let's enjoy the Lord this morning. Let me say something. As we're going to preface this, we've been in the Book of Revelation. We're going to continue until we complete it. The Lord willing, uh, we're going verse by verse, word by word. I don't want to leave out a word simply because it's too easy uh, when you miss a part of a a book or a chapter. All it has to do is miss one word to change the whole meaning. So we're going to continue that until we're completing it. And I realize that this is a, another view of God that we don't, we hardly ever hear about or hardly ever talk about. And this is about the anger of God, the wrath of God. And it's only on those who have rejected His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's hard for people to grasp that 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 ideology about God being anything but love. And God is love. He's all love. But He's also a righteous God who will judge sin. He's going to do that. And Revelations 15 and 16, we're, we're going to see something happening. It's like a rapid fire now. All of a sudden, from here to the end of the book, there's only uh, just the seven bowls of wrath that's going to be poured out in chapter 16. And from there to the end of the book, it's like bam, 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 until it reaches the point... Uh, the battle of Armageddon is going to be fought 
And at the end of that, near the end of that, it will be a time for the return of Jesus Christ for to set His feet down on the Mount of Olives, walk into the temple, sit down on the throne of God, and the Millennial Kingdom will begin shortly after He returns. By the way, you and I, if you are a believer this morning, you've trusted Christ, you and I will be coming back with Him to set up His kingdom on planet Earth. If we're alive during that seven years and we've missed the rapture, the sad part is the worst is yet to come if you're an unbeliever. And that's basically what God's... I've often wondered, God, why did you give us this? All of the things you're going to do when it's going to be after all opportunity for salvation is over, except for those who have never heard. And for the Jew, it was almost like God said, I'm warning you ahead of time. And if people put it off, and that's what the devil does, put it off, oh, wait till next Sunday to commit your life to the Lord. Wait till Wednesday night. And if he can get you one more day, that may be all it takes to take you out of here but without Christ. So, Pray about that this morning as we look again in the Word of God, okay? All right, guys, come and receive the offering and get right into the rest of the service. Okay, y'all stand back up with me again and uh, let's sing these songs today, but I got to hear you. I can't hear you. A while ago, you was kind of quiet, so I want to hear some volume. Okay? Okay? All right, all right. Huh? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. 
Stumble across the broken stream, stir the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky. This next song was pretty cool. It's talking about showers. Not that we've had any. But let's sing it, all right? There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above, showers of blessing, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. tell you about this next song real quick like they forgot to print a word in the bottom of it so when we sing roll gold and roll after that you sing hallelujah okay now you'll hear it here we go i 
Y'all like that hallelujah? Hallelujah. All right. Y'all can sit down if you want to. kids loose to joy celebration they're ready to go back there all right okay they're getting out the door, going back to have a good time and enjoy the Lord and aggravate the teachers. I'm sure they'd never do that. All of our children here are little angels. That's what Brother Jerry said. Yeah, they're always up in the air and harping about something. So I guess that makes them... Uh, we love our kids here. If you want to get in trouble, just start talking about the kids, because that's where I get all my information about you. <laughs> if I want to know anything about you, I'll ask the kids, and boy, they won't lie. Revelations, chapter 15, we're about to deal to the seven plagues, and we'll be talking about those, and of course, they're the seven bowls of wrath, God's wrath at the latter part, and they just get more intense and more intense. Um, even though we've already seen some horrific, if you will, things that have happened on earth. Someone asked me this past week a question that maybe might be in your mind, and since we're dealing with the eschatological events of what is, I'm convinced, soon to happen. And they asked me this, two things. They asked me, where do I believe we are in God's timetable? Well, my quick answer is right where God wants us. I don't know. To be honest, I, I do know that uh, from all that I've studied over the years, I'm convinced that the, the earth is ripe and ready for harvest. Uh, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ could come at any moment. I believe He could have come a moment after, the, after He descended to heaven. He could have come back then if God had determined that to happen. So far, it hasn't been that way. But we also have seen some events that have happened that, that lets us know uh, in the past few years, in the past ten years, I've seen more prophecies fulfilled than I have in the last 500 years. It's so rapid, happening so rapidly now. Beginning, uh, actually, back as far as the Berlin Wall, uh, when it was taken down, and all of a sudden we had unified Germany again, which is Gomer, uh, over in Ezekiel 37 and 38. And all, all the, I can only say this, all of the, Nations are in place where God said they would be. We've seen the rapid rise of Islam, which I believe is a biblical prophecy. We've seen the decline of, of biblical Christianity in America and other places. And I also believe, as this person asked me, I think that God's time clock, if I could look at it, I can only look at it through the lens of Scripture and also through the events that are going on in the Middle East. I can't determine what's going on by looking, what's happening in America. Although I can say this, certainly if there's anywhere in the world that we've seen the rapid decline in biblical Christianity, it's here because of materialism, one of our worst enemies, always has been in Christianity. And so what I, what I told them, and I'll tell you, that I'm convinced that we are within moments of the rapture of the church. Now, what I mean by that. Moments is an undeterminable amount of time. I don't know. But it must be soon. It has to be soon according to the way things are going. And it, well, it doesn't have to be, but it appears to be. And then the other question was, uh, where do I see America in prophecy? Well, it's sad to say, but it isn't found in prophecy. What does that mean to me? 
that means to me that between now and the time, especially of the that great coming war of Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's not mentioned there. It's not mentioned any in any of the scriptures that we've dealt with during the tribulation period. So in my opinion, there won't be anything called America during the end times. Now, some say, well, how could that be? We've been one of the greatest nations in the world. Um, the nation that forgets God will be turned into destruction, ladies and gentlemen. And we have forgotten God for the most part. So I'm saying all that to say this. The only reason I'm convinced that God gave us this book was to prepare us for that which we are already seeing happening. So this morning, I want you to know I only have one primary reason for preaching through the revelation is the way that I have, praying that just one person, if that's the only thing that happens, if one person gives their life to Jesus Christ because of hearing the, the Word of God at any point in time, then there's one more that won't go through what I'm about to preach this morning. And I'm praying that there's no one sitting here under the sound of my voice that will be here when these things that I'm going to share with you this morning happen. Now, the only way, and I'll make this plain up front, the only way that you're not going to be here is either for you to die before it happens or you trust Jesus Christ and you live through it. And if you live through it after the rapture of the church, and if you have heard the gospel, you won't be here. If you are here and you've never been saved, you will not be able to be saved because you've already heard the gospel and refused it. But if you're here and you hear the gospel this morning and you've never been saved, then I promise you, you may never hear it again. So you need to know, time in your case, if you're without Christ, is of the essence. Revelations 15.1, stay with me please. Chapter 14, we have saw the time for judgment. We have saw the beginning of the battle of Armageddon. We saw that blood flowing in the valley of Megiddo up to the horse's bridles, four feet deep approximately, and about 184 miles along the valley of Megiddo. And the Bible, the Bible tells us that, uh, gives us the exact furloughs there. It says that it would be uh, up to 600 furloughs, which is approximately 184, 185 miles. It'll be that deep. It's almost unconceivable uh, that they would be that much blood in one place. But here's why this is so important. And this is why it's so almost so um, unbelievable in this sense, is it takes how many people will die to allow that kind of blood to be flowing in the Valley of Megiddo. I can tell you multiplied thousands, multiplied maybe millions that will die under the hand of God's wrath. And then in chapter 15, he begins now as he begins only eight verses, one of the shortest chapters in, the, in this book, simply because what God is doing now is speeding up the process. Chapter 15, verse 1, stay with me as we read. And the Bible says, and John says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues. Now, there are those who believe that repetition is actually happening here in chapter 15 and chapter 16, that these just repeating what's already happened with the other, with the trumpets and uh, the other plagues that have already happened, but that's not so. The one word here will tell you that. He says, the last plagues. That means others have already happened and more are on their way to happen. This will be the last on planet earth. And he says, these are the last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. In other words, when all of these have transpired, God will have settled the issue of judging human sin on planet earth. Verse 2, and I saw, as it were, there's that words that tell us this is going to be a metaphorical statement. It's not going to be what we see. It's going to look like that. And he says, and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass Mingle with fire. That's what it appeared to look like. It looked like a, a clear sea mingle with fire, mixed with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Boy, i got to say something. I read that again, and it encouraged me. You know what? Through all of this that we've already covered, 
through the, the turmoil that's going on planet Earth, it seems like the very Earth itself is just is just literally up uh, had an upheaval, uh, gullies and um, valleys and earthquakes and ha- hailstorms and brimstone storms falling on planet Earth, and yet there's a there's a there's a commitment in many of God's people, and we see them as if they were standing on a sea of glass with har- harp speak of worship and praise. And here they are in the midst of all of these tur- all the turmoil, singing the victory song. I don't know this, but I want to believe they're singing victory in Jesus. Hallelujah. You know why? Listen, folks. Nothing can take away victory from the child of God that is settled in his faith in Jesus Christ. Not even death itself. I'm amazed today at how quickly people... Are professed Christianity lose their their stamina. They start the race off like it's going to be a hundred yard dash and they find out it's going to be a fifty mile run. And you can't we start off good, but then some little something causes us to stumble or get discouraged or and I'm not being critical, I'm just being analytical. I see it too often, people that start well and then you wonder what happened. I can tell you what happens. The enemy has just what he want and he'll offer it to you. All you have to do is quit serving God. That's all you have to do. And you can have all this, remember? Remember how that hmm, Jesus offered, was offered by Satan all the kingdoms of this world if he would just bow down and worship him. Listen, I promise you that the devil will give you anything you want if you'll surrender your convictions to Jesus Christ. He'll make sure you have all the things that you want. All you have to do is quit. These haven't quit. They're standing on the sea in the middle of all of this turmoil, and they're singing and giving God praise. In the verse 3, the Bible tells us, and they sing the song of Moses. If you remember well, Moses, when they crossed over on the Red Sea and got on the other side, there's recorded there in the book of Exodus a song that Moses sang, and one of the most beautiful. This isn't an exact replica, but it has all the elements of the song. Let's listen to it as we hear them once again singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb is, <laughs> by the way, the song of Moses is the song of the Lamb. You know what he was singing about? He was singing about the blood of the Paschal Lamb that let them come out of the land of Egypt under the protection of Almighty God. Now, these are going to be singing about the Lamb of God, which gave His life on the cross. And they're singing about the glorious Lamb and the victory that God's been given. Here's what they say in verse 3. Great and marvelous are thy work, Lord. God Almighty. One of the few times that phrase, Lord God Almighty, is used in the, in the book of the Revelation. And he says, You're just and true are all thy ways. Thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name. You know, I thought about this morning. There's very little fear of God before the people of America. Very little fear of God. And the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And here he says, Who is it that will not fear and glorify thy name? For thou art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. God, they can see all around you. They can see all around us how you're judging the sinful. And yet, as we know and we'll soon find out, in the midst of all this, the hard heart of mankind still refuses to repent. And it's almost to the end. Verse 5, and he said, and after that, John said, I looked. And behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Now, when he speaks of this, he's speaking about the holy of holies. Back where God used to meet His people in the Old Testament. Back where only the high priest could go. That holy place that God has set apart. Now, John is seeing that opened up. And that temple, at part of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues. And they're clothed in pure and white linen. And having their breasts girded with golden girdles. 
That girdle was like a stripe that comes from the shoulder down to the waistline, and gold's a type of deity, and literally it was manifesting the deity of Jesus Christ, the lamb that they'd been singing the song about, and the power of God's man Moses as he led the people of Israel out through across the Red Sea. And the Bible says there, not only that, in verse 7, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials. By the way, these vials are not like we would consider uh, experimental vials. They're like a saucer, a shallow instrument that was used in, ta- in, the, in the tabernacle worship. The reason that's so important, I want to, uh, what happens when God starts pouring out His wrath is going to be like dumping out His wrath. It's not going to be a trickle. It's not going to be a, just a mild pouring. It's like just dumping the saucer upside down. So it says, it see, uh, it's, and He sees these given golden vials full of what? The wrath of God. When, when I hear that, I almost tremble. Even knowing that we're clothed with the blood of Jesus Christ, I never want to have to face the anger of God. I, you know, it's an amazing thing. I don't know how it is that we've lost the vision of the God of the Bible. As loving and kind and gracious as He is, full of mercy, the Bible says, oh, to have God angry, to have God to have to display His wrath must be one of the most unreasonable things in humanity. How in the world? And yet I've seen people challenge God. If you're real, do this. And the only thing I can say is hang on for a while and He'll do this. But He'll do it in His time and His his way. And then He says, This full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. Even in the midst of all of this anger, even in the midst of all destruction, God reminds people, you're on this earth for one reason, and that's to glorify me. My glory is going to be seen on planet earth. No matter what the occasion, no matter what's going on at the time, I will not fail, and I will not share my glory with any man or anything that the beast has tried to capture, that the Antichrist has tried to capture, that the people that followed the Antichrist and, 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 and listened to his lies and saw his lying miracles realized that what they have to do is shun the glory of God and worship a false god. And by the way, even those who claim to be atheist, let me say something to you. Oh, you're not an atheist. You're just chosen to be your own god. So you worship someone. You know who it is? You. Say amen. There's no such thing as true atheism. Some people are going to worship something. And I have to admit, I was considered an atheist before I came to know the Lord and believed in my heart that I was. And then I realized after understanding the Scripture, I was in love with me. I was worshiping me. And by the way, there are people out there that claim to be Christians that are still doing that. I didn't know if I was going to get an amen out of there or not. That's kind of tough. Listen to this last part. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. You know what he's saying? This is the prelude of chapter 16. When the worst of the worst is now prepared to happen. I read this again this morning and wept openly. And I wondered, how in the world can someone know these things are coming? And yet, for whatever purpose in their mind, the delusion that they must have, the, 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 the acquiescence of, of moving away from anything that has any stability, any truth whatsoever, seems almost unfathomable. Chapter 16, verse 1, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now... Remember, the last seven plagues. I want you to hear them because they're going to be broken up in such a fashion that you can see uh, the horrendousness. 
out of all the others, if you put all the other things that have happened up to now in the book of the Revelation, along beside these seven things that are going to happen, they would seem almost trivial. God forbid that we'd ever think of anything as trivial that God does. Beginning in verse 2, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore. And it fell upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. I looked at the verbiage there, and I began to search to determine what kind of sore this is. And the Bible said it was a noisome sore. It's a sore that, that is not literally a, what we considered a, a boil or a sore. It's an inward thing that, that creates inside of those that were here. It's like a boiling up of the inner part. Any, the inner part of humanity is being dissolved by this terrible sore. That you, it's like having a pain and can't find it. It's like being eat up on the inside and not being able to stop it. And God has loosed this terrible thing upon those who have rejected, number one, His being, and number two, His glory, and His right to be God Almighty. What a terrible thought. To have humanity literally writhing in pain and not knowing what's causing the problem. Sounds almost like what hell's going to be like, doesn't it? Verse 3, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Wow. I thought recently, I was down at the coast, and I thought about these verses, and I I tried to somehow let my mind get a hold of As you well know, the earth is made up of what, 70% of the earth is water? 70, 75%, something like that. And all of a sudden, it all becomes like the blood of a dead man. Not like blood, but the blood of coagulated blood. And it, it appears that, that the, the waters themselves are going to be almost like congealed blood. And the odor. Wow. I can't even imagine how humanity that could live on a, on a planet that has that kind of Thing going on in it and how they could even survive. And it says, not only that, everything in the sea died. No more mullet. No more living animals at all. Can you... Recently, I was looking at a, something on, on, on the History Channel talking about all the multi... that there were more living things in the sea than they are on earth. And I thought, my... Can you imagine... Just the power of, of, of that thing happening and people having to be on earth and see that happening. And apparently it happens instantaneously. It's not a progressive thing. It just happens. Remember, pours out the vial and it happens. Mm. And then the third thing in verse 4. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of the waters. And they became blood. By the way, no more drinking water. The salt water is full of dead animals and the blood is of a dead man. And now the rivers and the creeks, and it talks about the fountain. These are the very springs, the inner springs of the earth that feed all of the streams on top of our planet. Wow. And the fountains of waters, and they became blood. Even as the spring feeds the streams and the rivers, it's blood. Um, did you notice that it didn't say it didn't become as blood? It says it became blood. Someone asked me, would it be the blood of humanity or the blood of animals? I don't know. It's blood. It doesn't say. But it appears to me that the most viable thing on earth still left. Remember all the things that have already been destroyed, a third part of the greenery, a third part of, the, uh, of, of all, the, all the green grass has already been disposed of and destroyed. And they're living on a planet that literally is as barren as Mars. 
By the way, I thought I had this thought. I said, today they're looking to see if there's anything alive on Mars. After this, you can come and see there won't be anything alive here to go look anywhere. And I just thought, how can we read something like this and then just go out into the world and act like, okay, everything's all right. Oh, uh, what is it? What's that thing? Don't worry. Be happy. I don't think you should worry, but I think you ought to be aware these things are coming. It's reality. This isn't science fiction. It's from the Word of God. So he says, verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Remember the angel, the messenger of the waters, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, and was, and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. You know what he said? God, your judgment is righteous. You've warned humanity for years, eons, that this was coming. And they had this ostrich syndrome with their head in the sand, going on like nothing was ever going to change. And now, here it is. And it's too late to do anything about it. You're righteous, God. Your judgment is true. And he continues in verse 6. He said, For they have shed the blood of saints and of prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for thou art worthy. I wonder if this isn't the voice of all those multitudes that was underneath the altar earlier in the book of the Revelation where they said, God, how long will it be before you avenge our lives, those that have taken our lives? How long? And I can tell you, and God is telling them, now is the time. Judgment is here. It makes you want to run out and tell everybody you love and care about that if they aren't where they need to be with God, for God's sakes, get there. Doesn't it want, make you want to do that? It does me. In verse 7, he said, I heard another out of the altar. That's why I believe it's those who may have been under the altar, saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true, righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel now steps out and pours out his vial upon, now it's not upon the earth only, it's upon the sun. And power was given unto him, the sun, to scorch men with what? Wow. Can you imagine the, all of a sudden, all the power and the heat that's in the sun now apparently being directed to humanity on earth? I think July and August is hot, but look, it's not hot. Some theologian did a scientific, and and I don't place a lot of uh, trust in these kind of things, but they suggested that the pits of hell would be something like 7,000 degrees. Well, you know, after you reach a certain point, you know, you reach a... To me, if you reach... 200 degrees, forget it. Everything else is ashes. But think about that. Now the sun, with all this going on here on earth, now the sun becomes the enemy of earth, in the hands of God at least. Verse 9 says, And men were scorched. The word scorched means burned. With great heat. And listen to this. And blasphemed the name of God, which had the power over these plagues, and they repented not to give Him glory. All that's happened, and their heart is still hardened. Uh, someone said, well, why, how, why can't people see what they need to see? And, you know, the truth of the matter is they're blinded. They're blinded. And the only thing that can open their eyes is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. The threat of being here on earth through all this. I know I was speaking with a man some years ago now, and we were talking about, in fact, I was preaching through the book of the Revelation to the church I was pastoring uh, years ago in Virginia, and he said, you know what? If I believed 
what was in the book of the Revelation, if I believed that that was really going to happen, you know, I would crawl across this earth on glass on my knees to make sure every person heard the gospel. Makes me wonder if we really believe these things are coming. The Son with that kind of power. And yet they looked at God and blasphemed His name. Verse 10, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom, now the Antichrist. Oh, you thought he was going to get by and be able to rule his kingdom in hell without having to face God Almighty. But no, even the guy who thinks he's going to be God is going to face the God who proves to him he's God. The filth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues with pain. Everyone that's followed the beast, those who have taken his mark, those who have, who have coveted his power that he offered, and by the way, people will do almost anything for power and money in that age and in this one. And now... Payback. The pain that they're going through, they're even they're chewing their tongue to try to deaden the pain, and, and yet there's nothing that'll do that. The verse 11 says, And even then they blasphemed the God of heaven. Because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Do you begin to get the idea that nothing that goes on on planet earth after the rapture of the church can ever change men's minds about who God is? You begin to get the idea that sin can harden a person's heart so bad until they can look the truth in the eyes. My daddy used to have a saying about me. He said, boy, you'd argue with a signboard and take the wrong road home. Y'all ever heard it? Sure you have. That's what they're doing. They're looking at the truth and saying, this is the way, and going the other way. They repented not. Verse 12, and the sixth angel, almost through now, poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, or Euphrates, when I was brought up saying it, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Whoa! Of all of what's happened with the blood and the waters, and uh, no one would in their right mind want to cross these kind of rivers. And now God dries it up so that the kings of the east, those who are going to bring the battle on, God is making it where they can come to make war. The kings of the east, so they can be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. That's one per, not three out of each, but three out of the three. For they are the spirits of the devils, of demons. They're working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole earth to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. You know what's happening? Now the God God is using Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and he's sending the demons out to bring them to the day that God's going to destroy them all. Isn't that amazing. Someone said, "You know what? You mean God's in control? God's never lost control, guys. He never will. He's using the demons as his." has his, what the word I'm looking for, his his ambassadors to bring him. Come on. Our boss wants you. It's amazing. They're responding, they think, to win a great war. Look at the balance. Here we go. In verse 15, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together unto a place in the Hebrew tongue called Harmageddon. In your English Bible, it's probably spelled with an A. 
but the original is spells Harmageddon, H-A-R. It literally translated means Mount Medigo. All of them is coming in one place. In verse 17, in the seventh angel, the last of the vials poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. Do you know why it's poured into the air? Think with me. Who's the prince and power of the air? God's about to wipe out Slewfoot's entire being. He's about to take away every ounce of power that he gave him originally. Everything that he has and has felt like he wanted to to ascend the throne of God. Now God's going to not only destroy his kingdom, oh, oh, but he's not going to totally destroy him because there's still an eternity in hell that he must go through. But he's going to take away the kingdom. He says he pours it into the air. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not sent since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Mm. I don't have any idea what that would look like, do you? I know that there's been some terrible earthquakes on this earth. By the way, the word earthquake doesn't just mean what we think. It means a shaking of the earth. It's like God's, by the way, Lord, I give you praise and glory. God's just got it in His hand saying, got enough yet? That's how big God is. And yet we treat Him like He's some little old servant that we're supposed... Listen to me. We got this thing so backwards. God is majestic, honorable, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's not our servant. We're His. Hmm. And that great city, speaking about the great city of Jerusalem now, was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nation fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of His wrath. I wish you could see that expression in the language. Literally, it's saying... Every ounce of God's wrath is poured out on that one thing called Babylon the Great. Can you imagine all the fierceness of God being in one place on one people? By the way, it's speaking of Babylon, as you well know, symbolic in the Scripture speaks of the false religion that's really ruled the world. And there's so many theories on that, I want to address it now. But I'm convinced I know exactly who he's talking about. Not because I'm that smart, because the Scriptures are so vivid and what we're seeing today is so right in line with what God's doing. By the way, the name Babylon, what does that do when you think of, where is Babylon? I asked this question the other day. Most of you know that Babylon is where? Iraq. It's not in Rome. Going to mess up your theology. Think about it. And if you dwell on it long enough, the little light will go on. God will let you see that. It was divided into three parts. That great Babylon came in remembrance in verse 20, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. That's because of God shaking this thing called earth. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. I looked that up. You know what that means? About a hundred pounds. Can you imagine stones falling out of heaven weighing a hundred pounds? That's not even enough left for a greasy spot. And men still, look at this. This is unimaginable. After all this, men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell. For the plague thereof was exceedingly great. God help us wake up and see the need. You say, well, preacher, what can we do about these things? I don't, I don't see but two things that God ever told us to do. 
Well, three things. Number one, first one, live your Christian testimony. Two, share your Christian testimony. Number three, pray for those who are without Jesus Christ. Pray, witness, live it. Jesus said two words to His disciples before commissioning them and giving them the ammunition they would need to win the battle. You know what He did? He said, follow Me. And then as He led them, He constantly shared who He was. I am not come except to give life. The only hope these people have that are facing the judgment of God is the Christian church. We have been commissioned to share the gospel of Christ. You say, preacher, I I share the gospel everywhere I go. Well, listen, I promise you, that's the only ammunition that God loaded this with. He didn't give us great artillery to go out and kill everybody. He didn't tell us to kill everybody that rejected our, our message, as some religions do. He said us to love them so much that we'd keep telling them. Quite a paradox, isn't it? And yes, I'm convinced that there's nothing left to be done before the rapture occurs and then this would last seven years. Here's a quick opportunity. I want to appeal to Christians first. If you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ and there's no doubt in your mind that you've been saved and you've given your life to Christ, then I want to ask you something. Are you, is your life such that people know that you represent Jesus Christ in your life? And then, if your life is that, are you bearing witness with your mouth that there is a real Jesus that really loves people and really wants to save them from such terribleness? And the last one is, if you're not a Christian... Boy, what an opportunity to give your life to Christ today. Not because you're scared out of, out of your wits, but just because God's pulling your heart and saying, come to me, I love you. Don't walk out of here and take the chance that, oh, well, I'll do this again another time. Someone has once said the enemy's greatest weapon is to get people to put it off till tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes. Will you bow your heads with me, please? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want you to know this morning I love you with all my heart, and I pray that God's speaking to you as He is to me. And if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, to be honest with you, there's things in my life that doesn't speak loudly of Jesus. It speaks a whole lot more of the world than it does of Christ. And I know that there's things that I need to ask God to help me with. And I know God wants to help me and will help me. All I have to do is say, Here, God, I repent of my sin and forgive me. And if you're a believer in the room this morning and you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be the witness. I've got people I love and hands are already going up all over the room. Yes, God bless you. You've got people you love, you care about, and you want to see them come to Christ. Then please, please share with them one more time. Even if you've told them a hundred times already, go back one more time and tell them. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I have never given my life to Christ. I may have been baptized. I may have joined a church, but I've never really given my life to Christ. And today I really want to surrender and say, Lord, here it is, not only because I want to go to heaven, but I want to be an instrument in the hands of God to help see others come to Christ. If you're here today and you want to be saved and give your life to Christ, just slip your hand up. Hold it up just a minute and slip it right back down. Anyone at all. But my last challenge is to us as a church. What are we doing here that will impact the world for the gospel of Christ? Pray about that. That we'll all be on the same ticket to get people to understand the gospel of Christ. 
Would you stand, please? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Brother Gene Rutledge, I want to ask you again to pray for us, please.